Green Tea by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu Read by Chris Turtle Part 1 Prologue Martin Heselius, the German Physician Though carefully educated in medicine and surgery, I have never practised either. The study of each continues, nevertheless, to interest me profoundly. Neither idleness nor caprice caused my secession from the honourable calling which I had just entered. The cause was a very trifling scratch inflicted by a dissecting knife. This trifle cost me the loss of two fingers, amputated promptly, and the more painful loss of my health, for I have never been quite well since, and have seldom been twelve months together in the same place. In my wanderings I became acquainted with Dr. Martin Heselius, a wanderer like myself, like me a physician, and like me an enthusiast in his profession. Unlike me in this, that his wanderings were voluntary, and he a man, if not of fortune, as we estimate fortune in England, at least in what our forefathers used to term easy circumstances. He was an old man when I first saw him, nearly five and thirty years my senior. In Dr. Martin Heselius I found my master. His knowledge was immense, his grasp of a case was an intuition. He was the very man to inspire a young enthusiast like me with awe and delight. My admiration has stood the test of time, and survived the separation of death. I am sure it was well founded. For nearly twenty years I acted as his medical secretary. His immense collection of papers he has left in my care to be arranged, indexed, and bound. His treatment of some of these cases is curious. He writes in two distinct characters. He describes what he saw and heard as an intelligent layman might, and when, in this style of narrative, he had seen the patient either through his own hall door to the light of day, or through the gates of darkness to the caverns of the dead, he returns upon the narrative, and in the terms of his art, and with all the force and originality of genius, proceeds to the work of analysis, diagnosis, and illustration. Here and there a case strikes me as of a kind to amuse or horrify a lay reader, with an interest quite different from the peculiar one which it may possess for an expert. With slight modification, chiefly of language, and of course a change of names, I copy the following. The narrator is Dr. Martin Heselius. I find it among the voluminous notes of cases which he made during a tour in England about sixty-four years ago. It is related in a series of letters to his friend, Professor Van Loo of Leyden. The professor was not a physician, but a chemist, and a man who read history and metaphysics and medicine, and had in his day written a play. The narrative is therefore, if somewhat less valuable as a medical record, necessarily written in a manner more likely to interest an unlearned reader. These letters, from a memorandum attached, appear to have been returned on the death of the professor in 1819 to Dr. Heselius. They are written, some in English, some in French, but the greater part in German. I am a faithful, though I am conscious, by no means a graceful translator, and although here and there I omit some passages and shorten others and disguise names, I have interpolated nothing. 1. Dr. Heselius relates how he met the Reverend Mr. Jennings. The Reverend Mr. Jennings is tall and thin. He is middle-aged and dresses with a natty, old-fashioned, high-church precision. He is naturally a little stately, but not at all stiff. His features, without being handsome, are well-formed, and their expression extremely kind, but also shy. I met him one evening at Lady Mary Hayduke's. The modesty and benevolence of his countenance are extremely prepossessing. We were but a small party, and he joined agreeably enough in the conversation. He seems to enjoy listening very much more than contributing to the talk, but what he says is always to the purpose and well said. He is a great favourite of Lady Mary's, who, it seems, consults him upon many things, and thinks him the most happy and blessed person on earth. Little she knows about him. The Reverend Mr. Jennings is a bachelor, and has, they say, sixty thousand pounds in the funds. He is a charitable man. He is most anxious to be actively employed in his sacred profession, and yet, though always tolerably well elsewhere, when he goes down to his vicarage in Warwickshire to engage in the actual duties of his sacred calling, his health soon fails him, and in a very strange way. So says Lady Mary. There is no doubt that Mr. Jennings' health does break down in generally a sudden and mysterious way, sometimes in the very act of officiating in his old and pretty church at Kenlis. It may be his heart, it may be his brain, but it has happened three or four times, or oftener, 
that after proceeding a certain way in the service, he has on a sudden stopped short, and after a silence, apparently quite unable to resume, he has fallen into solitary, inaudible prayer, his hands and his eyes uplifted, and then, pale as death, and in the agitation of a strange shame and horror, descended, trembling, and got into the vestry room, leaving his congregation without explanation to themselves. This occurred when his curate was absent. When he goes down to Kenlis now, he always takes care to provide a clergyman to share his duty, and to supply his place on the instant should he become thus suddenly incapacitated. When Mr. Jennings breaks down quite, and beats a retreat from the vicarage and returns to London, where in a dark street off Piccadilly he inhabits a very narrow house, Lady Mary says that he is always perfectly well. I have my opinions about that. There are degrees, of course. We shall see. Mr. Jennings is a perfectly gentlemanlike man. People, however, remark something odd. There's an impression a little ambiguous. One thing which certainly contributes to it people, I think, don't remember, or perhaps distinctly remark. But I did, almost immediately. Mr. Jennings has a way of looking sidelong upon the carpet, as if his eye follows the movements of something there. This, of course, is not always. It occurs only now and then. But often enough to give a certain oddity, as I have said, to his manner, and in this glance travelling along the floor there is something both shy and anxious. A medical philosopher, as you are good enough to call me, elaborating theories by the aid of cases sought out by himself, and by him watched and scrutinised with more time at command, and consequently infinitely more minuteness than the ordinary practitioner can afford, falls insensibly into habits of observation which accompany him everywhere, and are exercised, as some people would say, impertinently, upon every subject that presents itself with the least likelihood of rewarding inquiry. There was a promise of this kind in the slight, timid, kindly, but reserved gentleman, whom I met for the first time at this agreeable little evening gathering. I observed, of course, more than I here set down, but I reserve all that borders on the technical for a strictly scientific paper. I may remark that when I here speak of medical science, I do so as I hope some day to see it more generally understood, in a much more comprehensive sense than its generally material treatment would warrant. I believe the entire natural world is but the ultimate expression of that spiritual world from which and which alone it has its life. I believe that the essential man is a spirit, that the spirit is an organized substance, but is different in point of material from what we ordinarily understand by matter, as light or electricity is, that the material body is, in the most literal sense, a vesture, and death, consequently, no interruption of the living man's existence, but simply his extrication from the natural body, a process which commences at the moment of what we term death, and the completion of which, at furthest a few days later, is the resurrection in power. The person who weighs the consequences of these positions will probably see their practical bearing upon medical science. This is, however, by no means the proper place for displaying the proofs and discussing the consequences of this too generally unrecognized state of facts. In pursuance of my habit, I was covertly observing Mr. Jennings. With all my caution, I think he perceived it, and I saw plainly that he was as cautiously observing me. Lady Mary happened to address me by my name, as Dr. Hesselius. I saw that he glanced at me more sharply, and then became thoughtful for a few minutes. After this, as I conversed with the gentleman at the other end of the room, I saw him look at me more steadily, and with an interest which I thought I understood. I then saw him take an opportunity of chatting with Lady Mary, and was, as one always is, perfectly aware of being the subject of a distant inquiry and answer. This tall clergyman approached me by and by, and in a little time we got into conversation. When two people who like reading and know books and places, having travelled, wish to discuss, it is very strange if they can't find topics. It was not accident that brought him near me, and led him into conversation. He knew German, and had read my Essays on Metaphysical Medicine, which suggest more than they actually say. This courteous man, gentle, shy, plainly a man of thought and reading, who, moving and talking among us, was not altogether of us, and whom I already suspected of leading a life whose transactions and alarms were carefully concealed with an impenetrable reserve, from not only the world, but from his best beloved friends, was cautiously weighing in his own mind the idea of taking a certain step with regard to me. 
I penetrated his thoughts, without his being aware of it, and was careful to say nothing which could betray to his sensitive vigilance my suspicions respecting his position, or my surmises about his plans respecting myself. We chatted upon indifferent subjects for a time, but at last he said, "'I was very much interested by some paper of yours, Dr. Hesselius, upon what you term metaphysical medicine. I read them in German, ten or twelve years ago. Have they been translated?' "'No, I'm sure they have not. I should have heard. They would have asked my leave, I think. I asked the publishers here a few months ago to get the book for me in the original German, but they tell me it is out of print.' "'So it is, and has been for some years. But it flatters me as an author to find that you have not forgotten my little book, although,' I added, laughing, ten or twelve years is a considerable time to have managed without it. But I suppose you have been turning the subject over again in your mind, or something has happened lately to revive your interest in it.' At this remark, accompanied by a glance of inquiry, a sudden embarrassment disturbed Mr. Jennings, analogous to that which makes a young lady blush and look foolish. He dropped his eyes, and folded his hands together uneasily, and looking oddly, and you would have said guiltily for a moment. I helped him out of his awkwardness in the best way, by appearing not to observe it, and going straight on, I said. Those revivals of interest in a subject happen to me often. One book suggests another, and often sends me back on a wild goose chase over an interval of twenty years. But if you still care to possess a copy, I shall be only too happy to provide you. I have still got two or three by me, and if you allow me to present one, I shall be very much honoured. "'You are very good indeed,' he said, quite at his ease again. In a moment. "'I almost despaired. I, I don't know how to thank you. "'Pray don't say a word. The thing is of really so little worth that I am only ashamed of having offered it, and if you thank me any more I shall throw it into the fire in a fit of modesty.' Mr. Jennings laughed. He inquired where I was staying in London and after a little more conversation on a variety of subjects, he took his departure. 2. The doctor questions Lady Mary, and she answers. "'I like your vicar so much, Lady Mary,' said I, as soon as he was gone. "'He has read, travelled, and thought, and having also suffered, he ought to be an accomplished companion. "'So he is, and better still, he is a really good man,' said she." His advice is invaluable about my schools, and all my little undertakings at Dalbridge, and he's so painstaking, he takes so much trouble, you have no idea. Wherever he thinks he can be of use, he's so good-natured and so sensible. It is pleasant to hear so good an account of his neighbourly virtues. I can only testify to his being an agreeable and gentle companion, and in addition to what you have told me, I think I can tell you two or three things about him, said I. Really? Yes. To begin with, he's unmarried. Yes, that's right. Go on. He has been writing. That is, he was. But for two or three years, perhaps, he has not gone on with his work. And the book was upon some rather abstract subject. Perhaps theology? Well, he was writing a book, as you say. I'm not quite sure what it was about, but only that it was nothing that I cared for. Very likely you are right. And he certainly did stop, yes. And although he only drank a little coffee here tonight, he likes tea, at least did like it, extravagantly. Yes, that's quite true. He drank green tea a good deal, didn't he? I pursued. Well, that's very odd. Green tea was a subject on which we used almost a quarrel. But he has quite given that up, said I. So he has. And now one more fact. His mother or his father? Did you know them? Yes, both. His father is only ten years dead, and their place is near Dalbridge. We knew them very well, she answered. Well, either his mother or his father. I should rather think his father saw a ghost, said I. Well, you really are a conjurer, Dr. Hesselius. Conjurer or no, haven't I said right? I answered merrily. You certainly have, and it was his father. He was a silent, whimsical man, and used to bore my father about his dreams— and at last he told him a story about a ghost he had seen and talked with, and a very odd story it was. I remember it particularly, because I was so afraid of him. This story was long before he died, when I was quite a child, and his ways were so silent and moping, and he used to drop in sometimes in the dusk, when I was alone in the drawing-room, and I used to fancy there were ghosts about him. 
I smiled and nodded. "'And now, having established my character as a conjurer, I think I must say good-night,' said I. "'But how did you find it out?' "'By the planets, of course, as the gypsies do,' I answered, and so gaily we said good-night. Next morning I sent the little book he had been inquiring after, and a note to Mr. Jennings, and on returning late that evening I found that he had called at my lodgings and left his card. He asked whether I was at home, and asked at what hour he would be most likely to find me. Does he intend opening his case and consulting me professionally, as they say? I hope so. I have already conceived a theory about him. It is supported by Lady Mary's answers to my parting questions. I should like to ascertain more from his own lips. But what can I do consistent with good breeding to invite a confession? Nothing. I rather think he meditates one. At all events, my dear Van Loo, I shan't make myself difficult of access. I mean to return his visit to-morrow. It will only be civil, in return for his politeness, to ask to see him. Perhaps something may come of it. Whether much, very little, or nothing, my dear Van Loo, you shall hear. 3. Dr. Hesselius picks up something in Latin books. Well, I have called at Bolton Street. On inquiring at the door, I was told by the servant that Mr. Jennings was engaged very particularly with a gentleman, a clergyman from Kenlis, his parish in the country. Intending to reserve my privilege and to call again, I merely intimated that I should try another time, and had turned to go, when the servant begged my pardon, and asked me, look at me a little more attentively than well-bred persons of his order usually do, whether I was Dr. Hesselius, and on learning that I was, he said, "'Perhaps, then, sir, you would allow me to mention it to Mr. Jennings, for I am sure he wishes to see you.' The servant returned in a moment with a message from Mr. Jennings, asking me to go into his study, which was, in effect, his back drawing-room, and promised to be with me in a very few minutes. This was really a study, almost a library. The room was lofty, with two tall slender windows and rich dark curtains. It was much larger than I had expected, and stacked with books on every side, from the floor to the ceiling. The upper carpet, for to my tread it felt that there were two or three, was a turkey carpet. My steps fell noiselessly. The way the bookcases stood out placed the windows, particularly narrow ones, in deep recesses. The effect of the room was, although extremely comfortable and even luxurious, decidedly gloomy, and aided by the silence, almost oppressive. Perhaps, however, I ought to have allowed something for association. My mind had connected peculiar ideas with Mr. Jennings. I stepped into this perfectly silent room, of a very silent house, with a peculiar foreboding, and its darkness and solemn clothing of books, for except where two narrow-looking glasses were set in the wall, they were everywhere, helped this sombre feeling. While awaiting Mr. Jennings' arrival, I amused myself by looking into some of the books with which his shelves were laden. Not among these, but immediately under them, with their backs upwards on the floor, I lighted upon a complete set of Swedenborg's Arcana Celestia, in the original Latin, a very fine folio set, bound in the natalie livery which theology affects, pure vellum, namely, with gold letters and carmine edges. There were paper markers in several of these volumes. I raised and set them one after the other upon the table, and opening where these papers were placed, I read in the solemn Latin phraseology a series of sentences indicated by a pencilled line at the margin. Of these I copy here a few, translating them into English. When man's interior sight is opened, which is that of his spirit, then there appear the things of another life, which cannot possibly be made visible to the bodily sight. By the internal sight it has been granted me to see the things that are in the other life more clearly than I see those that are in the world. From these considerations it is evident that external vision exists from interior vision, and this from a vision still more interior, and so on. There are, with every man, at least two evil spirits. With wicked genii there is also a fluent speech, but harsh and grating, 
there is also among them a speech which is not fluent, wherein the descent of the thoughts is perceived as something secretly creeping along with it. The evil spirits associated with man are indeed from the hells, but when with man they are not then in hell, but are taken out thence. The place where they then are is in the midst between heaven and hell, and is called the world of spirits. When the evil spirits who are with man are in that world, they are not in any infernal torment, but in every thought and affection of the man, and so in all that the man himself enjoys. But when they are remitted into their hell, they return to their former state. If evil spirits could perceive that they were associated with man, and yet that they were spirits separated from him, if they could flow into the things of his body, they would attempt by a thousand means to destroy him, for they hate man with a deadly hatred. Knowing, therefore, that I was a man in the body, they were continually striving to destroy me, not as to the body only, but especially as to the soul. For to destroy any man or spirit is the very delight of the life of all who are in hell. But I have been continually protected by the Lord. Hence it appears how dangerous it is for man to be in a living consort with spirits, unless he be in the good of faith. Nothing is more carefully guarded from the knowledge of associate spirits than their being thus conjoined with a man, for if they knew it, they would speak to him, with the intention to destroy him. The delight of hell is to do evil to man, and to hasten his eternal ruin. A long note, written with a very sharp and fine pencil in Mr. Jennings' neat hand at the foot of the page, caught to my eye. Expecting his criticism upon the text, I read a word or two, and stopped, for it was something quite different, and began with these words, Deus miseriatur me. May God compassionate me. Thus warned of its private nature, I averted my eyes and shut the book, replacing all the volumes as I had found them, except one which interested me, and in which, as men studious and solitary in their habits will do, I grew so absorbed as to take no cognizance of the outer world, nor to remember where I was. I was reading some pages which refer to representatives and correspondence in the technical language of Swedenborg, and had arrived at a passage the substance of which is that evil spirits, when seen by other eyes than those of their infernal associates, present themselves by correspondence in the shape of the beast, Fera, which represents their particular lust and life, in aspect direful and atrocious. This is a long passage, and particularizes a number of those bestial forms. 4. Four eyes were reading the passage. I was running the head of my pencil case along the line as I read it, and something caused me to raise my eyes. Directly before me was one of the mirrors I have mentioned, in which I saw reflected the tall shape of my friend, Mr. Jennings, leaning over my shoulder and reading the page at which I was busy, and with a face so dark and wild that I should hardly have known him. I turned and rose. He stood erect also, and with an effort laughed a little, saying, "'I came in and asked how you did, but without succeeding in awaking you from your book, so I could not restrain my curiosity, and very impertinently, I am afraid, peeped over your shoulder. This is not your first time of looking into those pages. You have looked into Swedenborg, no doubt, long ago.' "'Oh, dear, yes. I owe Swedenborg a great deal.' You will discover traces of him in the little book on metaphysical medicine which you are so good as to remember. Although my friend affected a gaiety of manner, there was a slight flush in his face, and I could perceive that he was inwardly much perturbed. I am scarcely yet qualified. I know so little of Swedenborg. I have only had them a fortnight, he answered, and I think they are rather likely to make a solitary man nervous. That is, judging from the very little I have read. I, I don't say they have made me so, he laughed and I am so very much obliged for the book. I hope you got my note. I made all proper acknowledgments and modest disclaimers. I never read a book that I go with so entirely as that of yours, he continued. I saw at once that there is more in it than is quite unfolded. Do you know Dr. Harley? he asked rather abruptly. 
in passing the editor remarks that the physician here named was one of the most eminent who had ever practised in England. I did, having exchanged letters with him, and experienced from him great courtesy and considerable assistance during my visits to England. "'I think that the man one of the greatest fools I ever met in my life,' said Mr. Jennings. This was the first time I had ever heard him say a sharp thing of anybody, and such a term applied to so high a name a little startled me. "'Really? And in what way?' I asked. "'In his profession,' he answered. I smiled. "'I mean this,' he said. "'He seems to me one half blind. I mean, one half of all he looks at is dark, preternaturally bright and vivid all the rest, and the worst of it is, it seems willful. I can't get him. I mean, he won't. I've had some experience of him as a physician, but I look on him as, in that sense, no better than a paralytic mind, an intellect half dead. I'll tell you, I know I shall sometime, all about it,' he said, with a little agitation. "'You stay some months longer in England. "'If I should be out of town during your stay for a little time, "'would you allow me to trouble you with a letter?' "'I should be only too happy,' I assured him. "'Very good of you. "'I am so utterly dissatisfied with Harley.' "'A little leaning to the materialistic school,' I said. "'A mere materialist,' he corrected me. "'You can't think how that sort of thing worries one who knows better. "'You won't tell anyone, any of my friends, you know.' that I am hippish now, for instance, no one knows, not even Lady Mary, that I have seen Dr. Harley, or any other doctor, so pray don't mention it, and if I should have any threatening of attack, you'll kindly let me write, or, should I be in town, have, have a little talk with you. I was full of conjecture, and unconsciously I found I had fixed my eyes gravely on him, for he lowered his for a moment, and he said, "'I see you think I might as well tell you now, or else you are forming a conjecture. But you may as well give it up. If you were guessing all the rest of your life, you would never hit on it. He shook his head, smiling, and over that wintry sunshine a black cloud suddenly came down, and he drew his breath in, through his teeth, as men do in pain. Sorry, of course, to learn that you apprehend occasion to consult any of us, but command me when and how you like, and I need not assure you that your confidence is sacred. He then talked of quite other things, and in a comparatively cheerful way, and after a little time I took my leave. 5. Dr. Hesselius is summoned to Richmond. We parted cheerfully, but he was not cheerful, nor was I. There are certain expressions of that powerful organ of spirit, the human face, which although I have seen them often, and possess a doctor's nerve, yet disturb me profoundly. One look of Mr. Jennings haunted me. It had seized my imagination with so dismal a power that I changed my plans for the evening, and went to the opera, feeling that I wanted a change of ideas. I heard nothing of or from him for two or three days, when a note in his hand reached me. It was cheerful and full of hope. He said that he had been for some t little time so much better, quite well, in fact, that he was going to make a little experiment, and run down for a month or so to his parish, to try whether a little work might not quite set him up. There was in it a fervent religious expression of gratitude for his restoration, as he now almost hoped he might call it. A day or two later, I saw Lady Mary, who repeated what his note had announced, and told me that he was actually in Warwickshire, having resumed his clerical duties at Kenlis, and she answered, I begin to think that he is really perfectly well, and that there never was anything the matter, more than nerves and fancy. We are all nervous, but I fancy there is nothing like a little hard work for that kind of weakness, and he has made up his mind to try it. I should not be surprised if he did not come back for a year. Notwithstanding all this confidence, only two days later I had this note, dated from his house off Piccadilly. Dear Sir, I have returned disappointed. If I should feel at all able to see you, I shall write to ask you kindly to call. At present I am too low, and in fact simply unable to say all I wish to say. Pray don't mention my name to my friends. I can see no one. By and by, please God, you shall hear from me. I mean to take a run into Shropshire, where some of my people are. God bless you. May we on my return meet more happily than I can now write.' 
About a week after this, I saw Lady Mary in her own house. The last person, she said, left in town, and just on the wing for Brighton, for the London season was quite over. She told me that she had heard from Mr. Jennings's niece, Martha, in Shropshire. There was nothing to be gathered from her letter, more than that he was low and nervous. In those words, of which healthy people think so lightly, what a world of suffering is sometimes hidden. Nearly five weeks had passed without any further news of Mr. Jennings. At the end of that time, I received a note from him. He wrote, I have been in the country, and have had a change of air, change of scene, change of faces, change of everything, and in everything, but myself. I have made up my mind, so far as the most irresolute creature on earth can do it, to tell my case fully to you. If your engagements will permit, pray come to me to-day, to-morrow, or the next day, but pray defer as little as possible. You know not how much I need help. I have a quiet house at Richmond, where I now am. Perhaps you can manage to come to dinner, or to luncheon, or even to tea. You shall have no trouble in finding me out. The servant at Bolton Street, who takes this note, will have a carriage at your door at any hour you please, and I am always to be found. You will say that I ought not to be alone. I have tried everything. Come and see. I called up the servant, and decided on going out the same evening, which accordingly I did. He would have been much better in a lodging-house or hotel, I thought, as I drove up, through a short double row of sombre elms to a very old-fashioned brick house, darkened by the foliage of these trees, which overtopped and nearly surrounded it. It was a perverse choice, for nothing could be imagined more triste and silent. The house, I found, belonged to him. He had stayed for a day or two in town, and finding it for some cause insupportable, he had come out here, probably because being furnished and his own, he was relieved of the thought and delay of selection by coming here. The sun had already set, and the red reflected light of the western sky illuminated the scene with the peculiar effect with which we are all familiar. The hall seemed very dark, but getting to the back drawing-room, whose windows commanded the west, I was again in the same dusky light. I sat down, looking out upon the richly wooded landscape that glowed in the grand and melancholy light, which was every moment fading. The corners of the room were already dark, all was growing dim, and the gloom was insensibly toning my mind, already prepared for what was sinister. I was waiting alone for his arrival, which soon took place. The door communicating with the front room opened, and the tall figure of Mr. Jennings, faintly seen in the ruddy twilight, came, with quiet stealthy steps, into the room. We shook hands, and taking a chair to the window, where there was still light enough to enable us to see each other's faces, he sat down beside me, and placing his hand upon my arm, with scarcely a word of preface, began his narrative. 6. How Mr. Jennings Met His Companion The faint glow of the west, the pomp of the then lonely woods of Richmond were before us, behind and about us the darkening room, and on the stony face of the sufferer, for the character of his face, though still gentle and sweet, was changed, rested that dim, odd glow, which seems to descend and produce where it touches, lights, sudden though faint, which are lost, almost without gradation, in darkness. The silence, too, was utter. Not a distant wheel or bark or whistle from without, and within the depressing stillness of an invalid bachelor's house. I guessed well the nature, though not even vaguely the particulars, of the revelations I was about to receive from that fixed face of suffering that so oddly flushed stood out, like a portrait of Shulkin's, before its background of darkness. It began, he said, on the 15th of October, three years and eleven weeks ago, and two days, I keep very accurate count, for every day is torment. If I leave anywhere a chasm in my narrative, tell me. About four years ago, I began a work which had cost me very much thought and reading. It was upon the religious metaphysics of the ancients. I know, said I, the actual religion of educated and thinking paganism, quite apart from symbolic worship, a wide and very interesting field. 
Yes, but not good for the mind. The Christian mind, I mean. Paganism is all bound together in essential unity, and with evil sympathy, their religion involves their art and both their manners, and the subject is, it is a degrading fascination and the nemesis sure. God forgive me. I wrote a great deal. I wrote late at night. I was always thinking on the subject, walking about wherever I was, everywhere. It thoroughly infected me. You are to remember that all the material ideas connected with it were more or less of the beautiful, the subject itself delightfully interesting, and I, then, without a care. He sighed heavily. I believe that everyone who sets about writing in earnest does his work, as a friend of mine phrased it, on something, tea or coffee or tobacco. I suppose there is a material waste that should be hourly supplied in such occupations, or that we should grow too abstracted, and the mind, as it were, pass out of the body, unless it were reminded often of the connection by actual sensation. At all events, I felt the want, and I supplied it. Tea was my companion. At first the ordinary black tea, made in the usual way, not too strong, but I drank a good deal, and increased its strength as I went on. I never experienced an uncomfortable symptom from it. I began to take a little green tea. I found the effect pleasanter. It cleared and intensified the power of thought so. I had come to take it frequently, but not stronger than one might take it for pleasure. I wrote a great deal out here. It was so quiet, and in this room. I used to sit up very late, and it became a habit with me to sip my tea, green tea, every now and then, as my work proceeded. I had a little kettle on my table that swung over a lamp, and made tea two or three times between eleven o'clock and two or three in the morning, my hours of going to bed. I used to go into town every day. I was not a monk, and although I spent an hour or two in a library, hunting up authorities and looking out lights within my theme, I was in no morbid state as far as I can judge. I met my friends pretty much as usual, and enjoyed their society, on, and on the whole existence had never been, I think, so pleasant before. I had met with a man who had some odd old books, German editions and medieval Latin, and I was only too happy to be permitted access to them. This obliging person's books were in the city, a very out-of-the-way part of it. I had rather overstayed my intended hour, and on coming out, seeing no cab near, I was tempted to get into the omnibus which used to drive past this house. It was darker than this by the time the bus had reached an old house, you may have remarked, with four poplars at each side of the door, and there the last passenger but myself got out. We drove along rather faster. It was twilight now. I leaned back in my corner next the door, ruminating pleasantly. The interior of the omnibus was nearly dark. I had observed in the corner opposite to me at the other side, and at the end next to the horses, two small circular reflections, as it seemed to me of a reddish light. They were about two inches apart, and about the size of those small brass buttons that yachting men used to put upon their jackets. I began to speculate, as listless men will, upon this trifle, as it seemed. From what centre did that faint but deep red light come? And from what? Glass beads, buttons, toy decorations? Was it reflected? We were lumbering along gently, having nearly a mile still to go. I had not solved the puzzle, and it became in another minute more odd, for these two luminous points, with a sudden jerk, descended nearer the floor, keeping still their relative distance and horizontal position, and then, as suddenly, they rose to the level of the seat on which I was sitting, and I saw them no more. My curiosity was now really excited, and before I had time to think, I saw again those two dull lamps, again together near the floor, again they disappeared, and again in their old corner I saw them. So, keeping my eyes upon them, I edged quietly up my own side, towards the end at which I still saw these tiny disks of red. There was very little light in the bus. It was nearly dark. I leaned forwards to aid my endeavour to discover what these little circles really were. They shifted their position a little as I did so. I began now to perceive an outline of something black, and I soon saw, with tolerable distinctness, the outline of a small black monkey, pushing its face forward in mimicry to meet mine. Those were its eyes, and I now dimly saw its teeth grinning at me. 
I drew back, not knowing whether it might not meditate a spring. I fancied that one of the passengers had forgot this ugly pet, and wishing to ascertain something of its temper, though not caring to trust my fingers to it, I poked my umbrella softly towards it. It remained immovable, up to it, through it. For through it, and back and forward it passed, without the slightest resistance. I can't in the least convey to you the kind of horror that I felt. When I had ascertained that the thing was an illusion, as I then supposed, there came a misgiving about myself, and a terror that fascinated me in impotence to remove my gaze from the eyes of the brute for some moments. As I looked, it made a little skip back, quite into the corner, and I, in a panic, found myself at the door, having put my head out, drawing deep breaths of the outer air, and staring at the lights and trees we were passing, too glad to reassure myself of reality. I stopped the bus and got out. I perceived the man looking oddly at me as I passed him. I dare say there was something unusual in my looks and manner, for I had never felt so strangely before. The End of Part One of Green Tea by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu.